The Supreme Court votes to strip back the power of U.S. federal agencies and the decision could impact all areas of American business. That's coming up today on Business Matters. Good afternoon and thank you very much for being here with me. I'm your host, Don Ma. Starting off with markets today, all three major U.S. indexes inch down just a tiny bit. The Dow down one-tenth of a percent, S&P down four-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq down just seven-tenths of a percent. None of the three indexes changed more than half a percent for the entire week. But it is a bad day for Nike because its shares fell over 19%, nearly 20%, its worst day since 2021. So the route started after Nike told investors, things aren't looking so rosy. It's predicting revenue to fall 10% this quarter, and it's not expecting things to get much better next year either. Sales are set to fall in the mid single digits, it says, and its CEO today trying to ease investor concerns, telling them, don't worry, this is just a transitional period for the company. So the question is, what is behind the slump in sales? Well, it seems like Nike is blaming retailers ordering fewer shoes because Nike's stock is a little uh, stale and it's also facing challenges with the company's $2 billion digital commerce, Nike Digital, and slower demand in China on top of that. But, you know, Apple's China sales recently dropped a bit, uh, a lot, actually. Uh, sales were down reportedly 37% in the first two months of 2023. But, you know, what they did, really ingenious here, they cut iPhone prices by up to 20%, and now sales are roaring back. Fresh data seems to show shipments for May up 40%. It's rare for Apple to discount its flagship products, but the price cuts last year were in the run-up to China's second largest shopping holiday. Apple is in a fierce battle for China's number two smartphone brand with Huawei. Huawei leapfrogged Apple earlier this year after releasing a popular new range of phones. Now, how would you feel about getting paid $32.50 an hour to drive Uber? That's about $70,000 a year. If you work a standard week, that is. You would also get paid sick leave, accident insurance, and healthcare stipends, while Uber and Lyft have just agreed to do just that in Massachusetts. The, the state has sued the ride-sharing companies in hopes of forcing them to recognize drivers as employees and not contractors. Initially, the companies refused to do that, saying that it would be far too expensive. They also threatened to pull out of the state entirely if that became the new reality. But this morning, it did become the new reality, with drivers being offered a wage double that of the state's minimum $15 an hour. So it's still unclear if the new changes uh, in wages will push up the price of fares, though. Uber and Lyft also agreed to pay a $175 million fine imposed by the state, and the attorney general says most of that will go to drivers who were underpaid in the past. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, the Supreme Court uh, dropped a number of bombshell rulings today. We don't have time to go through them all. You can watch into the evening news later for more, but we are going to cover one of them, and that is the Chevron deference, which could have a major effect on businesses here in the U.S. The ruling strips power from federal agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Environmental Protection Agency. I spoke with Brownstone Institute founder, Jeffrey Tucker about the news. All right, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your time today coming back on the show. Uh, let me ask you, overturning the so-called Chevron deference, uh, what is the importance uh, from a business perspective as we are a business show here? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a boring name, Chevron deference, but what it really traces to is a 1986 Supreme Court decision that, that said to the entire court system, up and down, every different direction, that uh, that administrative agencies of the federal government could interpret uh, laws passed by Congress however they wanted. So, for example, if Congress said we want clean air, they turn that over to the EPA, then the agencies would interpret that, you know, what that means. And, and what that's amounted to is a kind of administrative uh, legislation. Uh, so the administrative agencies have been making law all this time. And over the decades, these agencies have gone crazy with this permission and this power 
to the point that it's disabled washing machines and 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 dishwashers and showers and uh, whole factories and coal plants and you just like you you name it. The agencies have have completely ruled the U.S. economy now for the better part of 40 years. So. Uh, and, and so that has mutated over the decades into this, uh, this very important decision that came out this morning, a 6-3 decision in which the majority said uh, Chevron deference is hereby overturned. So uh, that disables uh, the entire U.S. civil service from, from acting autonomously or and aggressively against uh, American, American business in whatever way they want. Okay, then what is the U.S. going to look like after this, right? Are our agencies going to stop what they were doing before this was overturned? If everything goes well, and of course, you know, the Supreme Court doesn't have a, a police force, but if, if the law is complied with, we're going to see a tremendous crumbling of this legislative, this regulatory apparatus that has hindered American enterprise for decades. And it's going to happen, I think, rather quickly. All right, let's imagine here for a second in a world where uh, these agencies can't just uh, impose new rules at will. Uh, what purpose would they serve in this, in this world where they can't do that? Uh, well, the original idea of the civil service, uh, dating from 1883, when it was born, by the way, I'm completely against it, this 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 change. <laughs> I would like to roll it back before 1883. But the original idea is that the the agencies would realize the goals of the legislature. So the legislature would pass something, and uh, the agencies would make sure that it comes to pass. But they were never given the the power to invent their own rules or interpret. Uh, congressional legislation however they wanted. They had to adhere very closely to what the legislation said. So, you know, for 40 years, we've been in this weird situation where every uh, business uh, person in America, uh, every industry, whether it's securities or, you know, like I say, energy or agriculture, everybody has had to go along with whatever the agency said, even if there was no basis in legislation whatsoever. Um, I've realized that this is this is so inconsistent with the Constitution, and it had to go down. If you had a responsible Supreme Court, they would have to strike down this Chevron uh, deference uh, decision from 1986. And sure enough, that's what happened. It's really unusual and really bullish, I would say, really bullish on America. Okay, uh, let me propose to you uh, an argument from uh, from the other side here. So, um, do you think without uh, the Chevron deference, uh, would Congress just be playing catch up to to the ever changing, fast moving modern business world in terms of regulation? Um, yeah, that's what they would have to do if they want to regulate business. That's what they have to do. But and at least it would be subject to some kind of control by the people's representatives, which is to say that we get government back in the, in the control of the people under the constitutional system. And, and if you don't have that, you, you don't have anything re remotely resembling freedom or democracy. <laughs> so that's really what's at issue here. Thank you very much for your time today, Jeffrey. My pleasure, thank you. Here's another question. Are American oil giants colluding to keep prices high? Now, it's a big claim, but Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is not afraid to say it. He says American businesses could be colluding with the international oil cartel OPEC to manipulate oil and gas production and raise prices. So the allegations stem from a review of a recent merger between ExxonMobil and Pioneer Natural Resources. The FTC looks to have stumbled upon something that suggested Pioneer's CEO had actually been trying to collude with OPEC. Though Pioneer, their CEO, and ExxonMobil have all denied the allegations, but Senator Whitehouse seems to be concerned that other American companies might be also doing the same thing. He's written to 18 oil giants demanding all communications with OPEC since 2020. He's given them until July 12th to reply. We'll keep you updated. And in a massive apparent bust, the Justice Department is charging nearly 200 people with taking part in health care fraud schemes. So the people are accused of participating in false claims topping $2.7 billion. NTD's John Marshall has the details. 
193 people, including 76 doctors, nurse practitioners, and other licensed medical professionals, were charged with health care fraud. The two-week-long sweep was nationwide. Authorities seized more than $230 million in cash, luxury cars, and other assets. I want to be clear. It does not matter if you are a trafficker in a drug cartel or a corporate executive or medical professional employed by a health care company. If you profit from the unlawful distribution of controlled substances, you will be held accountable. The vast array of schemes included getting kickbacks for fake drug addiction services and referrals, distributing more than 40 million medically unnecessary pills, and more than $900 million in bogus claims submitted to Medicare for unnecessary grafts. Nurse practitioners were pressured to apply the wound grafts to elderly patients who didn't need them, including people in hospice care. Some patients died the day they received the grafts or within days, court papers say. And as health care fraud schemes continue to evolve, so will the Justice Department's investigative and prosecutorial strategies. One complex scheme involved a $90 million wire fraud conspiracy and misbranded HIV medication. Prosecutors say drugs were bought on the black market, then repackaged and resold to unsuspecting pharmacies. As a result, some patients received something entirely different than their prescription medication. One patient passed out and was unconscious for 24 hours after taking an antipsychotic that he believed was his prescribed HIV medication. Sean Marshall, NTD News. And of course, we have to mention the big inflation report today. The Federal Reserve's favorite inflation gauge slayed, stayed flat in May. And this is the first time that PCE inflation did not increase on a month-over-month -month basis since November. And today's report suggests that falling gas prices and cheaper foods uh, helped to keep the price increases from accelerating. So what does that exactly mean for the economy and interest rates? I spoke to senior analyst at FX Street, Joseph Trevisani. Joseph, thank you very much for your time today. So the inflation print that we got from the PCE price index, uh, it seems to be uh, pretty good, right? What are your thoughts on it? Well, the, the inflation is moving in the Fed's direction. There are a couple of questions here, really two. The first is, is it moving fast enough for the Fed to make a credible case that it has defeated this bout of inflation? That, I would say, on the jury on that is completely out. Yes, it has moved down, and we, we, we ended up with 2.6 in the PCE, uh, rather than down from 2.8, and that's good. Of course, CPI is considerably higher, almost a full point than that. But as far as the Fed's rate program goes, that is what would be called, in logic, a necessary but not a sufficient fact. The next step is, does the economy itself warrant a rate cut? And that, of course, is unanswered. So, I mean, if you, if you were to make a, a judgment call, educated guess, if you will, should, should the Fed uh, cut rates based on how the economy is doing? I would say there, and I've said this for some time, as, we've, as you know, that there is no reason logically for the Fed to cut rates right here. The economy does not warrant a rate cut. It is not collapsing. Most of the, um, the particular statistics that the Fed uses are either strong or strengthening. So there really is no reason economically, aside from inflation, for the Fed to cut rates here. And I don't, can't come up with any good reason why they would. Okay, but here's the thing. There, there is a delay with whatever the Fed does, right? Uh, the, the Fed of funds course. rate, you know, raising it will have a delay uh, in terms of the impact on the economy and cutting it as well. So, I mean, maybe the Fed is thinking they don't want to make a move too late because right now we're seeing uh, some data points, at least, uh, that is pointing to a slowing economy. Yes, the economy has certainly slowed a bit, and you would expect that. But do remember, the, on the other side of the Fed's um, inflation logic is their very erroneous call starting three years ago that this inflation would be temporary and would, would dissipate very quickly. That turned out to be very incorrect. So I think the Fed will err on the side of rigor in the inflation fight, in the inflation fight rather than going moving too soon to make a rate cut. After all, the Fed's ability to prognosticate, to predict the economy is really no better than anyone else's. 
Well, do you think maybe the Fed is concerned about, I don't know, uh, the financial system, uh, banks here? Maybe there's something that on its mind that we can't see. That is true. And that, that of course, will, would relate specifically to the commercial real estate market, which is in a great deal of trouble and somewhat in turmoil. That, of course, harkens back to the 2008 financial crisis and many of the things that went back into that. That is, val um, assets on the books of banks that are becoming severely undervalued. They're dropping in value. But I don't really see any, any sign of that happening. And if the Fed knows or suspects that that is happening, they've certainly given no indication of that. Okay, uh, bringing it back to today's uh, PCE number, uh, does it give you confidence personally that uh, inflation is on its way down to the 2% two percent target? Yes, it does seem what it is. The PC rate certainly is on its way, is moving in that direction. There's nothing else you can say about it. On um, the prior month, it was 2.8. It was expected to be 2.7, and the core rate came in at 2.6. That is moving in the Fed's direction. And that is one of the things that Mr. Powell has said repeatedly. It has to be moving in our, the direction towards 2% that we want. But I don't think that changes the analysis that this is a two-step process. One, inflation has to be at or sufficiently in the direction of what it wants at 2%, and the economy needs an a rate increase. I don't think a rate decrease, excuse me. I don't think we have that second condition. All right. Very well. Thank you very much for your time today, Joseph. Yes, thank you for having me. Taking a quick break now, LeBron James' son will join him on the Lakers. We have the latest from NTD Sports Wiz, Dave Martin. And Warren Buffett says the Bill and Gates Melinda, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will no longer get his money after he dies. Find out where it's going. Uh, that and more when we return. And now for your sports and business news, we're joined here by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, how's it going? It's going well, Don. All right, Dave, I have to ask you, the NBA draft concluded yesterday, but not before LeBron James' son, Bronny, was selected with the 55th overall pick by LeBron's own Lakers. So what do you make of this? You know, that's where I was guessing it would actually go. I mean, a lot of us thought that, actually. You know, uh, this was the most intriguing part of the draft, if or even where Bronny James would get picked. There are really two main factors at play. I mean, one, LeBron James has long stated his desire to play with his sons in the NBA. And despite the fact he's about to turn 40, LeBron is still one of the best players in the league. It's an amazing ongoing story. And anyway, he can also opt out of his contract and become a free agent this summer. So the question, of course, became, would he that motivate a team to draft his son? Now, a year ago, had Bronny been eligible for the draft, he probably would have been picked higher than he was today. But a year ago, uh, he was a high school All-American senior. Unfortunately, later in the summer, he suffered a cardiac arrest. It delayed his year at USC. He never really got going. I, finished, I think he finished eighth on his own team in scoring. So his stock was down. I mean, that was a second factor. But of course, he's only 19, and this makes for a great story now. Because if LeBron sticks with the Lakers, and I would certainly think he will after his son gets drafted, you'll have his father and son sharing the court for the first time ever in NBA history. All right. Well, let me just give you a quick follow up here. So the NBA draft is only two rounds, right? Yet there seems to be quite an importance on being taken in the first round. How much difference is there salary wise between them? It's big. You know, basically it's guaranteed money. How this works is a first round pick. You get a four year contract. First two years are guaranteed while the next two years are team options. That's all 30 first round picks. And all those years are going to be, all those salaries are going to be over a million dollars. You know, and of course, the higher you're picked, the more money you make. Now, for context, last year's number one pick, Victor Wembanyama, he got $12 million for his first two years. The last pick of the first round, that was uh, Kobe Davis, I believe, got $2.5 million for each of his two years. So that's $5 million that last guy got. That's whether you make the team or not. Now, anyone taking the second round, there's no built-in guarantee on your contract. It's really up to your agent's ability to negotiate. Now, for Barney James, his agent, Rich Paul, he's got a really good Laker. He's got a lot of sway with the Lakers because he 
of course, represents LeBron. I wouldn't be surprised if he got a guaranteed uh, deal with them. Probably not for $2 million a season, but probably for at least a million. Meanwhile, LeBron, he can opt out um, and get a maximum deal of $162 million over three years. Uh, yeah. But I think he's staying with the Lakers. Well, sounds good, Dave. Uh, always great to have your insight here. Thank you very much again for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Don. Okay, moving on from that. The NFL loses the Sunday ticket case, and it's being ordered to pay $4.7 billion over antitrust violations. And the case could completely warp the NFL's business model while biting off two-thirds of its annual revenue. Here's more. A California jury rules that the NFL violated antitrust law and must pay $4.7 billion to Sunday ticket subscribers. That amount could go up to $14 billion if the ruling is upheld. 2.4 million household subscribers and 48,000 businesses could benefit. The case could completely warp how the NFL does business, including the fan experience. Fans sued back in 2015. They accused the team of conspiring to collectively sell media rights instead of selling individually, engaging in competition. What's at stake is the right to be able to purchase these independent games versus being required to purchase the Sunday ticket, which is an inflated price because you can't get it anywhere else. Attorney Katie Charleston says fans may pay less if the NFL ultimately loses on appeal. Sunday Ticket lets fans watch out-of-market games on Sunday. The NFL Sunday Ticket plus YouTube TV is four payments of around $87 or $349 a year. Fans can also buy Sunday Ticket only for four payments of around $112 or $445 a year. What NFL Sunday Ticket is charging you is more than reasonable. I live here in New York, but if I was a Los Angeles Rams fan, I might only be able to see one or two games a year. So what's it worth it for me to enjoy following my favorite team? Marketing expert Doug Zarkin says the NFL isn't overcharging. The average price of one NFL game last year was $377, according to Ticket Smarter data. Zarkin says paying $300 a year to follow every game from your favorite team is actually a bargain. If the NFL loses on appeal, Zarkin says he can see potential adverse effects throughout the business, even on ticket prices. If you don't have a successful team, and you're not putting butts in seats, and your games aren't high-viewed games because you're not a competitive product, you could very see how, very easily see how the math could go sideways. The NFL says it's disappointed by the verdict. It says it believes its model is by far the most fan-friendly distribution model in all of sports and entertainment. It says it will appeal. A few more stories for today. It seems Warren Buffett just change his mind on where his huge fortune will go after his death. He told the Wall Street Journal that, quote, the Gates Foundation has no money coming after my death. Instead, he's going to put his wealth into a new charitable trust overseen by his three children. He donated about $40 billion in total to the Gates Foundation in the past few years. Okay, and that is all, all the stories we have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any feedback for the episode, please feel free to let me know. You can email us at business at Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you back here on Monday.